It's a blessing to be here. Amen. Appreciate the songs. That's encouraging. You get away and you don't get to sing the hymns and stuff. That's why it's a blessing to have Sister Sherry play the songs as we're coming in. Kind of get a little bit of a flavor of church. And uh, I like having church. I think one good thing about this whole deal that we're going through is, well, I think at the end of the day, we're going to appreciate coming together and having church a whole lot more. All right, let's open up to Ephesians chapter number 2 this morning. Ephesians chapter number 2. And I'm actually, uh, at first I was going to preach the same message for both services, which I've never done. But then as I began to work on this, it's actually a two-part message. So this is part one, and then the next message at 11 o'clock will be part two. And so, uh, and it'll be posted later on. I think um, this message will be posted uh, Wednesday. Uh, no, tonight, and then 11 o'clock message will be posted on Wednesday. So when we think about all of this, what I want to draw your attention to, if those of you have been watching and been studying with us on our Wednesday night study of salvation... We've been dealing some with not only the, uh, the plan of salvation, but the theories of salvation. And really the underlying um, theme behind all of that when you study God's salvation is the fact that that's something that God does. It's God's saving us. He's the Savior, we're the sinners. And here in Ephesians chapter number 2, let's pick it up, start in verse number 1. And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, I like those two words, who was rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and, hath, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse number 8 is my text, for by grace are ye saved through faith. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being in church. Thank you for the joy of just being able to see your people. And Lord, the fellowship that we miss, Lord, we thank you that we're able to come together today. We're thankful, Lord, that we have a book we can open up. We have these songs we could hear we have a message, hopefully, that we can get something from your word. I pray that you'd wash me in your precious blood. I pray that you'd set me aside, that you might speak from the Bible and give us some encouragement and some help today. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. So we've been teaching some about salvation and how that the doctrine of salvation in the Bible shows you that God is the Savior, we are the sinners. And when God saved us, he saved us by his amazing grace. Now, we went through some things as far as just the teaching and the verses, and we're not doing a Bible study this morning. We need good doctrine, but we also need good demonstration. We need good teaching, but we need good examples. So what I want to do in these two messages is, I want us to look at some pictures of grace in the Bible. Because if you've ever been saved, you've been saved by grace. If you're sitting in this church and you got your King James Bible in your lap and you're in a good old-fashioned independent Baptist church, that's the grace of God. And you got your Bible right and you got your doctrine right, man, that's the grace of God. And sometimes I think we lose sight of that or we get so used to things we don't go back sometimes and reflect on God's amazing grace. I tend to think when we get to heaven... We are going to gather around and they'll probably have John Newton. They'll call him up there and they'll say, lead the chorus. And he'll probably lead us in that hymn, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. So let's look at a few pictures of grace. Turn over to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. Somebody said grace is a five-letter word, often spelled J-E-S-U-S. -S. 
I thought that was pretty good. And you know, people say that you fall from grace. You don't fall from grace. If you're saved, you fall in grace. You ever fly on an airplane and you're walking down that airplane, Second Samuel 9, and you're, uh, you're going down to the, God forbid, <laughs> you got to go to the little restroom and you go to the little closet and you're walking back there and somebody sticks their foot in the aisle and you trip and you fall? You don't fall out of the airplane. You fall in the airplane. If you're saved, you're in Christ. If you're saved, you're in His grace. A Christian doesn't fall from grace, he falls in grace. A preacher said this, Grace is the delivery of a jewel that nobody ordered, a burst of light in a room where everyone forgot it was dark. That's God's grace. You know, mercy closes the door to hell, but grace opens the door to heaven. Mercy is oftentimes described as, the, as God being merciful, as God not giving us what we do deserve, and grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy says, I won't send you to hell. Grace says, I'll take you to heaven. Amen. So thank God for mercy and grace. And somebody said, you catch grace as a man fills his cup under a waterfall. It's very, very abundant. Very abundant. Look over in 2 Samuel chapter number 9. And I think you know where I'm going with this. This is Mephibosheth. Verse number 1, David said, Is there any yet that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. The king, then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Therefore, thou therefore and thy sons... <clears throat> And thy servants shall till the land for him. And thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servants, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. You talk about an illustration of grace, a picture of grace. I call him a crippled child. You can call him a maimed monarch or a prince pauper. <laughs> I mean, this is the guy that was in line eventually for the throne. He was the son of Jonathan who would have been heir to the throne had not David been God's chosen. And of course it would have been Saul, it would have been Jonathan, then possibly Mephibosheth. And really when you think about Mephibosheth here, he's left of that lineage of the old king. Normal in normal times and normal history, what you would have is a king would take the throne and he would literally wipe out everybody that was associated with the old kingdom. He would really destroy the seed of the former heirs, but not King David. David says, I want to find that anybody that's left of the house of Jonathan that I can show him kindness. You'll notice the condition of Mephibosheth here. He says in verse number 8, he's a dead dog. Now I know we have our dogs and we treat them like little humans. You know, and we do all these kind of things. And, uh, but in the Bible, a dog is an unclean animal. Uh, the term dog's head was used of reproach and humiliation of oneself. The Gentiles were called dogs by the Jews. 
So you think about Mephibosheth, he sees himself not only in the wrong bloodline here, his lineage is wrong, he comes from Saul's line instead of David's line, he's in trouble. But he's also lame. He's got some problems, just like you and me. We were born into this world, the sons of Adam. When Adam had a son, his name was Seth, and the Bible says he was after his own image. That's the problem. The problem is we're the sons of Adam, and until you get saved by God's grace, you're a child of death and a child of wrath. And that was Mephibosheth. He had the wrong lineage, and he was lame. He was crippled from a fall. When Adam fell and he brought sin into the world, every single one of us, we're crippled, we're lame, we can't get around on our own. There's something wrong with us. We are depraved, we are wicked, we are unclean dogs. He said, well, I just don't think that's what I am. Well, I don't know that you've experienced God's amazing grace. The thing about somebody getting saved, the hard part is not somebody getting saved. The hard part is getting them to see they need to be saved. You have to see your condition, his lineage, his lameness. Notice his location in verse number 4 is a place called Lodabar. He's, he's in a place called Lodabar, which means no pasture land. He's separated. Low is the Hebrew word for no. Low. Tell your kids, low. No. Low. No pasture land. He is separated by King David by disaster, by disability, and now by distance. He's in a bad place. You know, this world's a bad place. This world just uh, seeps out sewage and spews out filth and spews out wrong theology and wrong ideas and wrong philosophies and is far away from the kingdom of God. The desolation of this land, Lodabar, the distance of this land's away from David, just like us. That's exactly where we are. And the picture of grace with Mephibosheth is wonderful because what happens here is there's kindness shown. You'll see it in verse number one. Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? And then notice what he says in verse number three. The kindness of what? God. The basis of this kindness, verse number one, is Jonathan. And then you'll see that he brings this kindness by way of his servants, but this kindness is the kindness of God. Has God been kind to you? Why would he even think about, who are you and who am I? That God would think about us. So, well, I'm one of the elect. I'm chosen before the foundation of the world. You're crazy. <laughs> You've lost your mind. Who are you that God would consider you? The Bible says for Jonathan's sake, and we know here the great type picture is, God has saved us for Jesus' sake. It's because of the love of Jesus Christ. We're saved because we have a Savior. We're saved because somebody took our place. Jesus died on the cross in my place. The Holy Spirit, as the servant, goes out and says, I want to find somebody that I can share this kindness with. I want to find a servant. I want to find a dead dog that I can show some kindness for and let them know that somebody's paid their price. Somebody has died in their place, and he wants to show the kindness of God. Mephibosheth came just like we were. He was dirty, he was filthy, he was vile, he was lame, he couldn't help himself. You couldn't save yourself. You say, well, I'm going to clean up myself. You're not going to clean up your life. Go ahead and clean yourself out externally, but internally you have a whole lot to keep working on. Amen. I'm still working on stuff, and I hope you are as well. He's still working on us. But notice here in the text, there's some changes that takes place when he experiences the kindness of God. Notice his name has changed. We don't have time to turn, but in 1 Chronicles 9, his old name was Merib Bel, which means Bel contends. His new name, Mephibosheth, means idol breaker or destroying shame. So his name's changed. Don't we sing that song? I've got a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh yes, it's mine. So what's your Hebrew name? Dawid. <laughs> Dawid. <laughs> I don't know as far as uh, if, if we're going to go by Hebrew in heaven. I kind of think that sometimes because a lot of times when they speak in, from heaven in the Bible, it's Hebrew. But 
We have a new name, and you'll notice this change from Mephibosheth. It's not just in designation. Notice it's in fortification. Verse number 7, he's protected. He's now protected by David and all of his land is protected. There's also restoration, verse number 7. He gets all the land back that's due to him. And then, verse number 7, there's association. He says, you get to eat at my table continually. That thing's repeated four times. I think David meant that. <laughs> you know, the Lord tells us over and over again, you're going to heaven. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. Amen. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, he says, I would have told you. How come some of us have questions and doubts about God's grace? How, some, how, come, how come some of us doubt and we begin to wonder, is it really so? Is it really true? God said, if it was not so, I would have told you. And he tells us, I'm laying up treasures here. I've got this place prepared for you. Absent from the bodies, present with the Lord. Over and over and over, you're going to sit at my table. I like the changes that took place when God saved him. Notice here in the text that he dwells at that table and he goes up under that table and I can just kind of see that tablecloth draping down and they push Mephibosheth on. If you came up and you saw him sitting at the table, you couldn't tell he was lame. That tablecloth and the king's draperies and all that stuff, that covers, it covers the ugliness of the past and it covers the lameness of Mephibosheth. God's amazing grace will cover your sin. Amen. It doesn't matter. I like when we come to church and, you know, I'm not looking at you saying, what did you do when you were 17 years old? What did you do when you were 14 years old? What did you do last week? <laughs> it's not about that. We're here under the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're not here to judge each other and pick fruit off the trees and try to compare one among ourselves. We're here because of God's amazing grace and he's done some amazing things in our life. Mephibosheth's a great type picture of that. Turn over to John chapter number 4. I'll give you two more. John chapter number 4. So preacher, I believe in salvation by grace through faith. Okay, well here's some great illustrations of this. Mephibosheth did not earn it. He was sought out. He was chosen because of the kindness and the grace of God. John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4. We had a crippled child or a maimed monarch. Now we have in John chapter 4, you know the story. We won't read the whole thing for the sake of time. But this is the woman at the well. We can call her the wayward woman or the discourteous dame. I don't know if that's correct terms or not. But the wayward woman ago. I preached on Samaritan sinners a few weeks ago, so we preached some about her. But you'll notice the thing in this passage in verse number 4 I find amazing. When we talk about God's amazing grace, is that he must needs go through Samaria. It's just something he had to do. He could have went along the coast. When, he, when he's going in, in the direction he's going from Galilee, he could have went across Jordan up through Perea. But he went straight through Samaria because he had a plan. He wanted to meet this woman the whole time. Just one person. Here's Jesus Christ taking time for one person. And I know God's busy. I know He's keeping up with the universe and running the galaxies and keeping all that. And there's 7, 8 billion people on this planet and all kind of things going on. But you as an individual mean enough to God that His grace will overshadow you. And His grace will seek you out. And a picture of God's grace and salvation is the fact that if you're saved, you're saved by God's grace. And He dealt with you personally. I oftentimes say God doesn't have any grandchildren. And by that we mean if you get saved, it's got to be a personal thing between you and God and you become a son of God. A son of God is a direct creation from God. Remember Adam, whenever he's created, God calls him a son of God. Then his son is said to be a son of Adam, right? Jesus Christ shows up and he's said to be the last Adam. There's no one made, no, there's no, he's, he breaks the mold. When you get saved, that image is restored, and you're now a son of God. That's an individual thing that happens. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
So that's a personal thing that takes place between you and God. It's individual. It's hard to describe. I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. I know the personal parts of it because 1 John tells us things about the record, but it says this record have I given unto you. But he says you have the witness in yourself. If I didn't even have the Bible, if somebody took my Bible away, thank God I got some verses memorized, but I know in my heart I've met God. The grace of God has done something in my personal life. He passed by my life. Yes, he used other people in my life, no doubt. And thank God for the chain of events that took place in our lives. We can all talk about it. We can say, yeah, so-and-so led me to Christ. So-and-so gave me a gospel tract. So-and-so invited me to church. And thank the Lord for that. But what's behind that? I'll tell you, it's not a what, it's a who. God's behind that. And the Lord has done certain particular things in your life where you and Him can meet. And that's what happens here. Jesus pushes the issue with her the issue is relationship, not religion. They get into a little arguing match. You imagine this woman, man, she's spunky. <laughs> I mean, she's not afraid, number one, to talk to a man back in that culture. I mean, you know, she's got problems. But to talk to a man, but then to talk to a Jew right out in the open, and then she gets to arguing with him. Notice she's contentious in verses 9 through 12. She's like, you know, what are you doing talking to me in the first place? Because he said, give me some water. And she's like, what do you, you have no dealings with us. What are you talking to me for? Then he's like, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me and I'd give you living water. Then she's curious, verse number 15. Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Then Jesus deals with the sin issue. Verse 16, go call thy husband. You see, you can't get saved unless you know you're a sinner. You can't come to the Savior unless you need a Savior. So the sin issue always has to be dealt with. The modern gospel now is one to where Christians are so worried about offending people that they don't even want to preach on the sin issue. And a preacher who's not going to preach the sin issue is not a preacher. You've got to talk about sin because that's your biggest problem. That's kind of what I'm using in the corona thing, and feel free to use it. A good way to talk about things is to say, you know, there's a, there's a virus worse than corona out there. And they're like, what? So say, yeah, it's called the sin virus. And only Jesus can heal you of the sin virus. And so this idea of sin, people want to tiptoe around, but Jesus gets right to it when she's all curious, and she's like, yeah. He said, okay. Whenever I lead somebody to Christ, and oftentimes I'll have them pray, I have them pray a specific way. I let them try to pray on their own if, they're, if they understand and they, they want to do that on their own. That's always the best. But if they have a hard time, some people just aren't used to this. I say, okay, well, pray with me. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell. If they stop right there and they begin to hiccup, then you need to go back over some scriptures. If you don't think you're a sinner and you don't think you deserve to go to hell, why do you need to be saved? The sin issue has to be dealt with. So Jesus does that. Go call thy husband. She's like, what do you mean my husband? I ain't got no husband. <laughs> verse 12, verse 17, 18. What we see here, not only is she curious, but she's corrupt. And then verse number 20, she, she tries to circumvent the issue here. Our father's worshipped in this mountain. She's sidestepping everything. But in Jerusalem, you say it's a place to worship. And then he gets back to the whole issue here. You worship, you know not what. Salvation is of the Jews. Verse 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, the woman saith, I know that Messiah cometh when he is Christ, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. She is finally convinced. What does she do after this? She goes and compels others. Verses 28 and 29. Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. Verse number 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified he told me all that ever I did. A picture of grace. Here's this wayward woman. She has to come out at a certain time of day, not when normal people come out to get their water. She has to come out in the middle of the day when it's hot because she's not that type of woman that people want to be around. Nobody cares about her. The men she's had, they just used her and abused her. They didn't really love her. They didn't really care about her. Hey, if somebody's not willing to spend some money, put a ring on your finger and spend some time and, and do something, they don't really care about you. 
Amen. And so here's a woman that nobody cares about, but Jesus cares about her. You ever get that way sometimes? Maybe even before you were saved, you thought you were not even worth saving. Maybe even now. And by the way, none of us are really worth saving because we hadn't added anything to God. People say, well, you need to go out and prove yourself. You need to go out and persevere to the end. Prove that you're one of the elect. Well, you're never going to really persevere to the end. You can't live sin. You can never live up to what He's done. We can never pay Him back for how good He's been to us, to how He passed by our way, how He dumped all that grace in our life and had so much mercy on us, we can never repay Him. He's been so good to us. This wayward woman, this rough, crude woman, I imagine her grammar was about as bad as mine. <laughs> and she was just rude and uncouth and nasty. Jesus cared about her. She's convinced and then she goes out and preaches. Now, she doesn't preach as far as being a pastor, but she goes out and tells all these people, and they listen to her. You know what? If you men want to open your mouth, God will find a woman to open her mouth. Not being a woman pastor. Don't go out here. Or he'll have a child open their mouth. And she compels others to come. Take a left turn. Let's do the last one here. John chapter number 3. Here we have a religious ruler. I call him a religious ruler and a dubious disciple because you read about Nicodemus later on a couple of places and Nicodemus you know, helps with the burial of Jesus Christ with Joseph of Arimathea and so Nicodemus is a disciple. We would call him a closet Christian kind of like because he's still a part of this religious group. It's kind of like some people you see in politics now or you see them in certain places and they really are saved but they've been in a certain system and been in a thing for so long and you, they, they can hardly pull out from it. It's kind of like Daniel. You know, Daniel was in that political arena there. But Nicodemus starts off here in verse number 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Back up to John chapter 2, if you will, and notice verse number 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Verse 1, there was a man. So here we have this big contrast, really, when you look in chapter 3 and compare it to chapter 4. In chapter 3, we have Nicodemus. He's a man. chapter 4, we have a woman. In chapter 3, we have a Jew. In chapter 4, it's a Samaritan woman. In chapter 3, he's a respected ruler. In chapter 4, she's a social outcast. In chapter 3, he's considered a moral man. She's considered an immoral woman. In chapter 3, he came to Jesus by night. She's out in the middle of the day talking to Christ. In chapter 3, he had no arguments. In chapter 4, she was full of debate. In chapter 3, he was cautious. chapter 4, she's very bold. In chapter 3, he didn't seem to know what he wanted. In chapter 4, she knew exactly what she needed. In chapter 3, one fades back out into the darkness. In chapter 4, one goes and tells everybody she sees. Big contrast between this man that's a religious ruler in chapter 3 and this woman in chapter 4. But you know what? They both need saving. Aren't you glad we're all different? Aren't you glad you're not like me? <laughs> Aren't you glad? I'm glad I ain't like you either. Um, this world is composed of different types of people. And sometimes you get around people and they rub you the wrong way. Sometimes when they go through, a, some people when they go through a crisis or they go through problems, they get mad, they get just furious. Some people, they get afraid. People react to different things differently. Here's this religious ruler and he's got this whole system and way that he's going about things because of his whole life and everything that's built around it. Here's this woman with a complete, totally different life, but they all need saving. It's the drunk on the street that needs saving. It's the rich person in the corporate world that needs saving. It's the uh, worker out there cutting grass, Brother Chris, amen, amen, that needs saving. It's the person behind a computer screen all day at work in some state job, amen, that needs saving. 
It's uh, little kids that realize they're going to die and go to hell that need saving. It's older people that live their whole life without God and without church that don't even have time to live their life for God that need saving. We all need God's amazing grace. And so when you look at these little pictures of grace, I think it helps us to understand and realize that it encompasses everybody. I love John chapter 3 because of one of the greatest verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Your neighbor across the street needs saving. The uh, person across the world needs saving. We all need God's amazing grace. Notice here that he's a primary man. He's a principal man. Verse number one, Nicodemus, the word Nico, just like you read over in Revelation 3, Nicolaitans, the, the clergy over the laity, it has to do with the word being over something. So it meant victor over the people. So he was a ruler. He was a ruler of the Jews, the Bible tells us. But he also was a polite man. He comes to Jesus and he's very polite. He addresses him as rabbi, which is respectful because Jesus was a teacher and he called him rabbi. He's a polite man and he's also what you would call a pious man. Several years back, probably 50, 60, 80 years back, the word pious was used in a good sense, just like the word religion. Somebody would say, I got religion, and they would mean I trusted Jesus. And we don't really use that now. But the word pious, when they say so and so forth is a very pious person, they weren't saying, hey, he walks around with his nose in the air. They're saying that he is an upstanding person. He was a Pharisee. And if you know anything in the Bible about Pharisees, they were very meticulous and scrupulous about the religious code that they lived. There were certain things they would not do because of their religious order. And they were very disciplined about that. Paul was a Pharisee. And so Nicodemus was a pious man. And you know, I think it's people that live very moral lives that have the hardest time with the grace of God. People that live good lives. You know, there are a lot of good people that die without Jesus Christ. There are good people that die and go to hell. There are good people in hell right now. If we could pull back the earth and we could see down in the spirit world, down into hell, there are some good people beside the bad people. And when I say good, I'm using it in the sense of if you examine their life, they paid their taxes, they helped out their neighbors, they might have been very good to their civic duties and took care of things, they might have been respectful, they might have took care of their mothers and fathers and their kids, and they they might have been true to their spouses and they live moral upstanding. Some of them might have lived better lives than some church people. And they're dead and they're in hell. Why? We studied. Why? What's the sin that puts people in hell? It's unbelief. If you don't take the cure, you die corrupt. And that's the great illustration of it. Here you are, you're sick, here's the medicine, take the medicine. Well, I'm not going to take the medicine. Why did he die? He died of the disease. No, that ain't why he died. He died because he didn't take the medicine. We all have the sin curse. We're all headed for hell. If you don't take the medicine, which is Jesus Christ, and you don't believe, you'll go to hell, no matter how good a person may be, how moral a person may be. The hardest people to tell about Christ and to try to get them to see their need for Christ are good people. Especially the older they get and especially if they've been around Christians who have fallen or if they've been around Christians who not, aren't and maybe as good as they are. You know, there are Christians that do things wrong. I can get an amen on that. Well, you know, I know of a deacon that embezzled some money. What's that got to do with you dying and going to hell? Well, I know of a preacher that ran off with the secretary. Well, I know of a choir member who went out on Saturday night. Every Saturday night, he partied at the bars and sung in the choir on Sunday. People didn't like to stand in front of him because it stunk so bad. <laughs> All kind of things. Well, if you knew what such and such did to me, I ain't ever setting foot back in that church again. Hypocrisy and that Pharisee... At pharisaical spirit a moral person has a hard time seeing their own immorality he's a pious man the Bible says there's none good no not one that's the theological comment on it 
Somebody says, well, I'm good. You know how people do. I'm good. Well, uh, technically you're not. Of course, you make them mad. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, About like that, nine inches maybe. And mine age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. The best moral person you can find will still go and burn in hell unless God's amazing grace saves him. We are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we do all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have carried us away. He's a pious man, a polite man, a principled man. But notice also he's a panicked man. This guy is afraid. Notice he comes by night. Now, we could talk about him being a coward or we could talk about the crowds. Maybe, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt for a second. Maybe he is wanting to get some alone time with Jesus. And Okay, we can preach that for a little while. But let's just think about it this way. He's a Pharisee. He doesn't want to be seen talking to Jesus. He's a Pharisee. He don't want to be seen asking about questions and learning from Jesus. He's panicked. Notice he's perplexed. Jesus hits him right off the bat. Verse number 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse number 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He does not understand this. Jesus says, look, man, you've got to be born twice. You've got to be born of the water. You've got to have a first birth, a physical birth. Obviously, you've had that because you're standing here. Then you have to have a spiritual birth. And by the way, we'll study this maybe later on in our, in our study of salvation. But verse number 5 is not baptism. Amen to that. All the religions try to teach that. Well, you have to be baptized to be born into the kingdom of God, and then later on you can make a profession of faith. That's not what it's talking about at all, because verse 6, he explains verse 5. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That's the water. You come in a sack of water. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. He doesn't understand. Verse number 9, how can these things be? Jesus says in verse 10, art thou a master of Israel, knowest not these things? And then Jesus goes on to describe them in terms of the book of Numbers where he talks about the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness. And how that when they saw that serpent lifted up in the wilderness, all they had to do was look because they had been bit by these serpents. And if they saw the serpent on a pole, they could be healed. And he goes on to describe that's exactly what's going to happen. Christ is going to be lifted up. He uses that phrase two or three times in John. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw them into him. And when Jesus is lifted up on the cross, all we have to do is look and believe. That's the illustration. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You look and you can live. And so that's the gospel message here. Of course, we preach. And Nicodemus heard this, and eventually he's persuaded. I don't know how much under, Nicodemus understood at this point and how much he understood later on, but we do know in John chapter 7, he actually defends Christ. In John, in John chapter number 7, you read about Nicodemus in verse number 50. It tells us that he, um, I'll, I'll read it to you here. Nicodemus saith unto him, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? He's standing up. He's actually at a point, even among his peers, where he's willing to stand up and say, What are you doing? You're judging this man unlawfully. That's a good sign. And then in chapter 19, he comes and brings a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight, to help with the anointing and the embalming and so forth that they do for the body of Jesus after he dies. I believe he's a persuaded man. And he turns, of course, in his belief to Christ. Grace is the one thing all three of these characters have in common. That's the one thing we have in common. We all have the same Savior. We have different backgrounds. If we were to go around the room and ask for testimonies and we went through and started talking about our lives and how God brought us to where we are, and how he saved us, they would all be different, but yet they would all be the same. Because God's amazing grace has come into your life. 
Now, you have to believe it. If you don't believe it, if you don't accept Christ, if you don't receive Him, if you just push Him away, what would it have been like if Mephibosheth would have refused David's kindness? That would have been foolish. For Mephibosheth to say, no, I think I'll just stay here, you know. I think I'll just stay here in Lodabar. I can't grow any crops and nothing's working good down here. And I, I can't get these, <coughs> there's no pasture land down here. For, and I'll, I'll just stay down here and take my chances. How foolish that would have been. What about the woman when Jesus Christ point blank told her about the living water and he point blank told her he was the Messiah? What if she would have just went on in her own stubbornness? How foolish that would have been. And for Nicodemus here to hear those words, John 3, 16, with his own ears by Jesus himself, how foolish would that have been? And I think about so many people that we all come in contact with they turn down God's amazing grace. The bad thing and the tragedy about hell is that people don't have to go there. The tragedy about God's grace is that people turn it down. God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. I think I'll close with this poem. It's a song. You've probably heard it sung before. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God sent his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels' song. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Aren't you thankful for God's amazing grace? You say, preacher, that's just real simple. You didn't give us any deep nuggets. Well, it's some pictures of grace. Sometimes you look in the mirror and you see your, your beautiful mug. And you see how you're getting younger and younger as the years go by. You know what you're looking at when you look in those eyes? You're looking at a Mephibosheth. You're looking at a wayward woman. You're looking at a crippled child. You're looking at a religious ruler. You're looking at a sinner that God has saved by His amazing grace. When we get to heaven, we're not going to have any merit that we bring and say, look what I did. And you say, well, I might get a crown. Well, if you get a crown, you know what you're probably going to do? You're going to take the thing. So I don't know if I'll get a crown. I might get a little piece of a jewel or a little chip of a diamond. Whatever. If, if you get something, you know what you're going to do? You're going to throw it at his feet. When the time comes to crown him king of kings, we're going to be taking our crowns because the Bible says he wears many crowns. And we're going to be casting our crowns at his feet because it's not about what we've done. It's all about what he's done. Aren't you glad that he saved you by his amazing grace? Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your amazing grace. Lord, none of us deserve where we are. Lord, not just being saved.